Like anything in farming, you can take as many preventative measures as possible in the nursery, in the field to ensure your plants are pest and disease free. But sometimes things happen. Plants get disease, pests show up. If you look at lettuce versus other common market garden crops, how susceptible are lettuce to disease and pests versus those other crops? It's quite the opposite of most everything else. So for lettuce, has what I found the, the lowest pest pressure on our farm. We don't really have that bad of a problem. Where everything else, it's, it's, just a, it's just a daily battle, it seems like, of just keeping up with everything. But for lettuce, we don't really need to do much. We have really good, healthy soil. We do have a pest issue in the wintertime with aphids that we, we try to stay on top of. Really, from April till November, there's just very little issues that we have to deal with. But on the disease side of things, it's the opposite. So it's like the number one crop that, has the, that can have the most disease, where everything else, we don't really deal with it that much. So I'm really focused on diseases is our problems currently. When we started out, I would say pest was definitely one of our biggest issues with lettuce, mainly deer. Deer was brutal. Had a little bout with armadillos there for a few summers, but that was rough. Moles can be problematic. And I would say aphids in the winter. But diseases is where year round, every single week, we have to be very observant and diligent about doing preventative practice, preventive systems from diseases really causing us harmful economic damage. If you're agnostic about disease and you just didn't care, weren't really paying attention, are you running, how much of pressure is disease? Is it one of those things where you'd regularly be losing a significant chunk of crops? Is it something where that disease shows up, but it's patchy, it's not a huge factor? Like on your farm, how big of pressure does disease apply? Back, I would say six, seven years ago, it was like in the wintertime, it would not be uncommon for us to lose 70% of our crops. This winter, maybe we're at three to 5%. So if we were to let it do its thing without doing any preventive measures, it would be catastrophic. It would not be profitable growing, at least in the wintertime, for sure. In your book, chapter seven, for people following along, there's a lot of diseases you said you face, tip burn, damping off, fusarium wilt, mildew, lettuce drop. Which one of those is the biggest problem today? Or maybe with growers you've talked to, what's the most common disease problem you think they're going to face? That's probably a better, more targeted question. Yeah. I think it's probably lettuce drop. In, tw in 2019, we had this new disease called Fusarium wilt, which came from California, blew in from a hurricane that summer, and that was brutal. So we had, that was a soil-borne disease, and that was before we uncovered our field. We had this one tunnel that we could, we could not grow anything in that until we really addressed this problem. That was like the, the, the last, probably the latest disease that we like had to really deal with because we were we could not grow anything in this one area right now probably like lettuce drop i would say is probably one of the most common things which are tends to be exasperated by excess humidity if we leave the row cover on for too long that can flare yeah and looking at the picture it looks like you imagine a beautiful head of cell nova and then all of a sudden it looks fried and just laying flat on the ground. It looks like wet toilet paper. It, that lettuce drop is sclerotinia is rough as well. Has those really hard fruiting bodies at the base of the plant. Those are pictures that I took. I believe it was the winter of 2019 or maybe it's 2020. It was really pronounced in a certain bed. And then I peeled back the base. You could see those fruiting bodies. And once you see those, you need to get burned. You don't want to put that in your compost piles. One of the things about disease is a lot of times on these short-lived crops, by the time you see it, 
there's really nothing you can do to treat it. Like downy mildew and stuff like that, you can apply stuff, but it does become systemic and it's hard to reverse it. So disease, like many things, is a prevention versus a treatment type yes. problem. When If you got a bed where you notice a disease, what's your process? Is it to just take it out right there? Do you try and remedy it? How do you deal with, say, you got some downy mildew in one of your beds of lettuce? The first thing I would do was, would be to uh, take out that crop, like in any kind of affected leaves that I saw, and discard. I would actually probably put that in the trash can and throw it, make sure it leaves. It's the first thing. And then in the winter, which is where we see this most commonly to be destructive, would be I would check my soil moisture content and I would make sure that water didn't make sure that water turned off and stayed off on hook on hook the chip tape so no one would accidentally turn that on because that's one thing that's going to keep the, the disease from coming up is too much moisture and I would leave row cover off even if I had a really cold night I'd be like you know what I'm not going to, I'm most likely going to lose a lot of this already. So I would rather give it more airflow than, than to try to cover it. So if I covered that, then it just, in my experience, it's almost like, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm going to lose 50% more than I would have if I would have just left it off and let it get really cold. But other than that, I have not done anything personally that is, effective in reversing this disease or even i can slow it down some but even that i'm very limited it's okay i messed up my soil was too wet i left the row cover on too long that's usually like the too big or maybe when I'm, i had some other diseases some guy stepped in that leaf and they tracked it over here or maybe some tools didn't get cleaned properly something happened if you i see it? one or two i'm not gonna i'm gonna watch for it very carefully but I, it's not going to be a big deal. But once you get in that 5 to 10% loss range, it's okay. We made a growing mistake somewhere. Where was that made and how can we eliminate that? And do you notice it being patchy when the disease does come in? Or are you seeing, is it focused on one section of a field or bed? Or are you seeing like rows? No, it'll, like, yeah, it'll be like a patch. Maybe there's a patch here and a patch. 30 feet, and it's like these random patches, and they spread. That's what I see. Occasionally, you'll see this lettuce right next to it, just like never got affected. I've always said, I was like, man, I wish I could let, let that grow, collect the seed from that, and save that seed, because that it was, was resistant to sclerotinia or fusarium will. So there's always those kind of one offs like, what in the world is going on? But in general, that's been the case. Last year, we had, for the first, I've actually never saw this before, we had root knot ne nematodes in our lettuce. And it was only in one bed in this 10-foot section of the Because we planted it, it's on this, this section of plants that they just all died. It was very random. And so I pulled it up and we could see where the damage was. So we planted a different crop. We did some things. I think we did official nematodes. That's what we did. So we planted a bed on top of that same exact scene. It wasn't until we steamed that bed did, did that actually get rid of those nematodes that were killing all those lettuces. So yeah, prevention's a key for a lot of these. And a lot of that is taking care of in soil fertility, applying organic matter so you have good, healthy soils, airflow, which you've mentioned keeping excess moisture off plants, keeping roots so they have access to oxygen. You're doing the foliar and fertigation, feeding yep. to give plants that extra boost to help protect them. Biofumigation, soil steaming, those are two things maybe people haven't actually tried before. Soil steaming, what's that like? Soil steaming is definitely a very aggressive measure for your farm and probably of reach for most farmers but it's very possible you can rent one for a very affordable rate what that's doing is you're essentially you're injecting steam through a steam sock 
that runs the length of your bed. And Steam is trapped by a layer of poly that's held down by chains. And the idea with this is you're just trying to sterilize the top two inches of your soil. So think about if you were, if you had a raised bed, right? You went to, you wanted to buy sterile weed free compost. Apply that. It's got somewhere the same thing. Like if sterile, it needs to be rejuvenated with earthworms and microbes and things like that. Uh, so what you're doing with steam is you're essentially killing all your weed seeds, all your beneficial microbes, all your beneficial and harmful nematodes, any soil-borne pathogens that's in the soil. So you're, it's literally, you're starting with a clean slate. There's nothing. Kill the good and the bad. Now, what I found is that below that, that two-inch mark, still is keen with light. So it's not like you're nuking soil down 20 feet and it's just, it's touched forever. I've seen earthworms come to the surface of soil within 24 hours after steaming. So this is 100% effective for all diseases that I've seen on the farm. And it's been pretty crazy because we steamed the whole farm last season, all but four beds. And those four beds are the worst growing beds on our farm. It's crazy. It's just insane. One thing, so there's some unintended effects that were surprising, and that was the amount of nutrients microbes release once they die. We doubled our salad mix yield right after we steamed. So we did a bed of salad mix before, one after, and it was double. It was insane. Tomatoes, we had the year before, 250 pounds of tomatoes in that one bed. We had some diseases in that one bed. After we steamed, no nutrition, we had 1,000 pounds. So almost a 3x increase in yield, with no, no disease. So we saw it erratic, lettuce drops, sclerotinia. It did fusarium will, food not nematodes, gone, completely eliminated. But it is more aggressive. And so one thing that's crazy about these microbes is that we know we have a good amount of microbes in our soil. And so when we kill those microbes, they release this massive flush of nutrients. And there's a picture there too from David Hawk's farm up in near DC. He's a certified organic farmer as well. And that picture there, if I remember correctly, he added no fertilizer. And that's just after their summer of growing, he steamed it through that kale and it's just going in busters. So one, one measure to take, and like he came up before, it's a business. If you run into enough issue, business. Yep. there's only so many levers you have to pull. It may come to the stage where, like you said, let's hit the reset button, start over yep. and, and go from there. One other thing you talk about in this chapter seven, preventing disease and pests, spraying crops with a backpack sprayer. I don't want to get into brands, but have you had luck? Have you found that to be successful with some of these foliar sprays of different products out there? Very much. And I would say where I'm at now is we're only using a fogger. So we have a battery powered fogger versus a sprayer. And the, the difference between the two is the sprayer has like this, it's more of a, a direct spray. So it's got this fan and wherever that fan hits, that's what's going to get hit with whatever solution you're spraying. A fogger is like, it's really, it, it is what that name implies. It's like this fog, right? So all those micro droplets, say if you're using a, a regalia right? or fish emulsion, you're wrapping around every stem, stem underneath the leaf, like the 100% of the plant and its surface will be covered by that. So it's a lot more effective. And that's all we're, and that's all we're using, except for when we apply beneficial nematodes. And we'll maybe use like a direct a sprayer. But now we're from that and just using fertigation. And that fire, that's something you carry around? Yep, it's battery powered. It's very quiet. It's very easy to use. Yeah, we'll have to link to that in the notes, but yeah, that, that's one of the things to help work on the preventative side, give plants all the nutrients they can get and microbes they can get to help fight off 
the disease producing ones. Let me just make sure that's it for this one. Diego, do you mind if I just briefly hit the solar solarization of biofumigation as a cheaper way to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's do that and then I'll wrap it up. All right. So there's two other methods of eradicating a diseased soil, or if you, or kind of like we talked about, if you want to have a, if you want to hit the reset button. And the first one is soil solarization, where you're essentially taking, you're killing the bed, you're getting it, make sure it has adequate moisture. You cover that with a clear poly seal up a tunnel, and you're just basically letting time it takes about eight weeks for this to happen. You're just really getting that soil, and that will get rid of all your weed seeds, any soil pathogens. You'll have a beautiful, clean tunnel with no weeding. It'll be amazing. You'll have zero disease, zero weeds. So that is the cheapest probably easiest way to get into this. The downside to this is that it takes time, right? So if you're, if you're in the middle of a high production farm, you don't have eight weeks in peak season to, to do this. But if you are like in your first year and you're like, it's pretty hot anyways, I want to take the summer off. This is a really great way to do that. The next step is biofumigation. This takes about two weeks. So you can use, if you use grass clippings before, make sure it hasn't been sprayed, or you can use a mustard, which has really nice gasification pro properties in it. And so what you're doing is you're applying this to the bed, you're tilling that in, and then you water that. Okay, if you grow mustard as a cover crop, you're just maybe getting a flail mower, breaking that in, tilling that in there, watering, that, covering that with clear plastic. And that takes about two weeks for that to break down. The mustard releases gases, which kills a lot of these pathogens. And so this is highly effective as well. I have eliminated a fusarium wilt, which is one of the most toughest diseases, soil-borne diseases that I've had on my farm. So this, that's been very highly effective. Again, it takes two weeks. Um, it's a lot more attainable to pull that off than something like a steaming. It takes a lot less time than sol solarization. So those are the three methods that I've tried that I've had 100% success with. So you've got three, and the biggest difference between the three, oh, the biggest ones for us as a business is time. Steamy takes a couple hours and you're done. Next day you can plant. Fumigation is two weeks. Unless you grow much as a cover crop, then you, you're probably going to be weeks. Adding organic matter to your soil so that's plus and the longest is your soil solarization which to be clear the soil solarization can only happen in the hottest part of the summer because it needs you're relying on just heat to to kill off any of those soil borne pathogens and weed seeds but all three are very effective i've tried it myself on my farm and have had great success and i've seen no negative implications on Soil biology, the one caveat with all that is that I use a product which is called Fulganics 800. It has 800 species of microbes, protozoa, fungi, mycelium. It's just, it just really helps re-inoculate your soil with just good biology that will really help jumpstart your farm.